I've never felt fear once. Really? When it comes to art. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like, no freaking way. I almost believed you. <laughs> Which is why Christian art has the reputation it does without going into specifics. <laughs> I'm not going to knock we'll throw that out there. But it's, it's true. <laughs> I do like that place of like, I'm like sink or swim. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. 10 times out of 10, you'll swim in some way. Perfect. So there, it there's, gets, there's nothing that will gets muddy. Will kill your art quicker than than perfectionism. Yeah. Because perfectionism is inherently fear based, and it's not even when he has figured out the answers to the questions. Mm. It's when he's run out of questions. Because it's it's not even about knowing all of the answers. It's about the honest journey that counts. Hey, Caleb. Nice to go. Hi, Joel. How are you? I'm really good. Um, we are here. We're here. It's uh, your inaugural podcast. Um, honestly, mine as well. We're gonna we're gonna figure this out together. Wait, this is your first time? Yeah, I've never. I don't know if that's good to admit or not, but uh, <laughs> this is this is where we're at. <laughs> um, but I'm really excited to have you here and just to like have this discussion uh, on whatever it's gonna be. Um, I, I think it might be important to um, paint the picture a little bit um, in just that I I wrote like a whole bunch of questions and we were kind of preparing for this. Um, and really the heart of the podcast is a conversation in the first place. But I think I come from a, okay, let's, let's prep, let's get it, let's get it figured out. And I sent you an email with these like yes. list of questions and you called me and said... You didn't like them at all. <laughs> you well, were like, I, was, I was like, there's nothing here that sparks my imagination. Yeah. I feel like we could have this conversation or some version of it, but I don't know that <laughs> I don't know that it will be yeah. illuminating. Yeah, and I agreed. <laughs> I I myself was like, I tried to get to a place of recalling our past conversations and where we'd gone in those we had gone really deep and we had gone to a place that was really um um that affected me mm. um, and that I felt like I, I really got something out of and I tried to recreate that and it just didn't work. And so I just think it's uh, this podcast, this episode, this conversation is literally going to be, I was thinking about it on the way over here. This is going to be an exercise in what we talk about the, the journey of creativity of figuring this out. Um, it is an act of faith. It is. It is an act of faith. And if you, if you try to control the process with any work of art, but I think, honestly, anything in life, um, we will we squeeze the life out of it often. Yeah. But it's 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 fear, because we want a certain outcome. Um, but the good stuff is right where we're in that 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 in between place where we're operating out of giftings, we're operating out, out, out of a skill set, disciplines. Um, and yet we're right at the edge of what we don't know. Yeah. And we need grace in that place. Yeah. That's where the magic happens. Yeah. I feel like for myself, um, I've only very recently been able to acknowledge the fact that I am fearful of the unknown. Um, a spe very specifically, I mean, I think generally throughout my life maybe, um, but in the creative space too, Um it's it's easy to fall into that that fear of the unknown of not knowing and especially with how uh society or just uh social media or all of that like there's all this pressure to have mm -hmm. it figured out and to know and um to act like you know mm -hmm. when i think um like god calls us up to that space with him Yes. And being able to um, partner with him in the unknown. Like many times God does not spell out things to 100% completion. You have to take that step forward with him. Mm. Um, and so I, 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 for myself, yeah, even just acknowledging that fact of the fear of the unknown, uh, even just, again, with this podcast in itself, yeah. um, there's just that anxiety that like rises up in you. Mm -hmm. Um and so I think this is going to be an interesting um, self, like an actualization of this conversation in itself already embodies what we're like. It is like, a microcosm of yeah. our larger artistic endeavors. Yeah. 
How has that manifested in you? When you feel fear and the desire to control something, how does that play out for you? I would say for, I've seen it um, a couple of different ways in myself and in other people. For, for me, I shut down um, and, I, and I don't go any farther. I just kind of, I just, I almost imagining myself, like I just sit down, like on the journey, on the path, to whatever we're going, I just kind of like cross my legs and I sit down. Oh, wow. Um, other people I've seen it manifests where they, they absolutely just like they bat in the hatches and they just like trudge forward. Oh, yeah. Um, Hyper work mode. Yeah. And like, I used to think that that mode was the better of the two. Like if I could just figure out how to do that, hmm. but I think I've come to realize that they both have pros and cons. They, they both are not walking in freedom mm -hmm. of the, like the freedom of the creative process. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they're both just doing it in their own self-controlling ways where I control it by not doing anything and other people control it by just forcing through yes. to the end. Yes. Um, have, have you like, does that resonate with you? Do you process it in a completely different way? I've never felt fear once really? when it comes to art. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like, no freaking way. I almost believed you. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, dude, every every artist has, has, has come face to face with some kind of fear in the process of making something. And it's, what do you do with that? You know, it's uh, kind of the classic quote of courage isn't the absence of fear. It's what do you do in the face of it? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, my tendency is to go into like hyper, hyper work mode mm -hmm. where I'm, I'm just going to white knuckle this thing and get it done and figure it out. Um, the problem with that, it makes me feel better for a little bit because I feel like I'm controlling my own destiny. The problem though, is you can smell the art <laughs> that is made in fear. It, it, it has a certain, it has a certain fragrance and flavor to it. Um, I'm not going to call out any works by name because I don't. <laughs> this isn't the place for that. Um, but you can, you can, you can just sort of tell. Maybe a better way of saying it is, um, I believe that works carry the spirit of the manner in which they were made. Mm. So if they were made in a place of freedom, you feel that freedom. Mm -hmm. um, but they were, if they're made in a place of fear, you, you can feel that fear. And that could be fear of a million different things. You know, fear of acceptance versus not being accepted. Um, whatever financial pressures, you know, from the studio or, you know, whatever is happening on, in, in the back end. Um, there's all kinds of fears that people fear, feel. Um, so the question isn't, do you, or do you not feel that, but what do you do with it? Yeah. Um, so I've had to learn my process has, has been such that if I begin to feel that, um, I will put down the work for a little bit. Hmm. That doesn't mean that I shut down and won't work for weeks, but if I can sense in me an anxiety and the art is coming from that place, if I'm working on a song or if I'm working on a production, whatever it is, if I feel this thing rising up in me, I, I will simply take a break yeah, and get new perspective and come back with fresh eyes because I don't want that, the work to carry that particular spirit. Mm -hmm. Was there like a kind of this, an incepting moment where uh, that that fear based creativity shifted into uh, into the freedom because a, a lot of times when I when I see you or, or I see how you operate now and in the conversations that we've had um, you the way you approach creativity is so much different is so counter culture to to so much of what I see um, and what is embodied currently. Um, even in the way you, you talk about like promotion and, um, getting out there and so much of it is about views and about content. You got to get out to the masses and all of that. And you really don't care 
about that. Um, I, I do care. You do care, <laughs> but it's but it not, does look different. Absolutely, yeah. It looks it looks very different for you. What what did that? Was there like an incepting moment where that kind of started to shift for you as on your journey of of creativity? I wouldn't say there was any silver bullet moment where I, I thought one way and I overnight thought another way, but a series of moments with God over the last. 10 to 15 years. Um, one example that comes to mind, I made a record in 2007. And my goal for this record was, I want to make it. <laughs> like, I'm a songwriter. I want to get this record out. I want to get signed. I want to do this for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And so I was making decisions based off of what would be the thing that would make this most palatable, most likely to be found, Mm -hmm. most likely to get signed, most likely to make it, whatever that means, whatever, you know, we we, artists sort of start off with these vague notions of success. (laughs) If you ask them what that means, it might be hard to get a, a, a solid answer, but I had this vague notion of success in my head. And so it was a very... I'm glad I made the record. It was, you know, I go back and listen and, and laugh. Uh, there's some there's some great moments, but I a lot of the decisions were made based off of I want to get signed, mm-hmm. and so the vocals were all, all pitch corrected and processed in a certain way. And I'll never forget releasing that record, and it was satisfying. It was the first thing I had ever done. Um, it was before we started the band Carousel. My wife and I have what, a band What year Carousel. was that? Uh, 2007. Okay. So this was um, under my own name. And I remember releasing it and feeling the sense of unsatisfaction. It was satisfying to finish something. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was great. And to release it. But I remember feeling afterwards that it wasn't fully me. And so for the next one, I would graduated college. I set up shop in Tallahassee where my friend Brad and I uh, he was going to FSU. I moved there to start a band with him. Uh, it is what became Carousel. But for that record, it was very much the anti-record that I had made before. <laughs> so there were no rules. And I remember thinking, I'm just going to sing how I feel this song should, should be sung. I'm just going to let it naturally arise from me. Mm-hmm. And there is no right and there is no wrong. And that something about that just... It it, 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 something shifted for me where I was like, no matter what I do, it will be right because it's from me. Mm-hmm. And this is my creative expression. There is just something about that. Whatever I do, it will be right. Um, so vocally, I just began going to new depths and creatively and, and my production um, prowess. I, I just started doing things I would never have done two or three years before because there were no rules. Yeah. And um, we released that record, and it was the first thing that I'd done that I was absolutely proud of. And that process just continued over the, over the coming years. And increasingly so, I found myself in conversation with God about it. Um, we did this music video a couple years later where it was like a 360 music video where... Uh, we filmed it with a, we we created a 360 camera out of GoPros on a helmet. Yeah, and a person is walking through th- all these rooms, and depending on where the viewer is looking, the music will pan around them. So if they're looking at the lead guitarist, it'll pan depending on what they're looking at. So it was this innovative thing. Yeah, way before his time. It, for 2012 <laughs> or 13, it was it was there was not a market for that. Yeah, but um, when we released it. Uh, there wasn't a proper pr- place for it to live. And because we were sort of inventing the technology as we were going and coding and things, um, it was just it was just a little bit before its time. And so it didn't fly the way that I thought it would. Yeah. And I was devastated. And I remember years later talking to God about that and saying, what was that about? Could you redeem that experience, that year and a half of just a year and a half effort that turned to dust in my hands? And... That night, I had a dream about a new kind of music video. Hmm. And I called my friend, the same guy that coded the first one, and I said, I had this dream 
I wonder if this is possible. And his response was, it's actually quite simple to do. It's just that it's never been done before. Mm. And so we did it. And it all, <laughs> it all came from discussion with God. And I had a dream that, that night. So At the end of, of that. Of that year and a half year cycle. Year and a half. Absolutely. And so I thought to myself, well, that's, that was a lot better. Mm. <laughs> so, and that was 2016. So it was just been a process of learning to trust that he is, he wasn't just the creator once. Mm. He is the creator. In fact, it's the first way he revealed himself to humanity. Yeah. Was as a loving creative. <laughs> and then he re reveals himself as, you know, as Yahweh and as father and as shepherd and as deliverer and all these wonderful things that he is. But his first act was to create. Yeah. And I had this wonderful thought years ago, who's to say that he has not gone on creating, mm. but now he has human partners. Mm -hmm. And so wittingly or unwittingly, people have partnered with the creator of the universe all throughout humanity. But what a privilege that as believers, we get to knowingly enter into that relationship. We get to, as sons and daughters of the living God, of the creator God, we get to invite his creative energy into, and we get to partner with him. I don't want to just say invite him into what we're doing. We actually get invited into what he's doing. Yeah. We get to begin to dream his dreams. And so that image just began shaping my creative life. I'd say 2015, 16, 17, this image of holding hands with Holy Spirit. And God said to me once, you can go wherever, you can go to the darkest places, but if you're holding my hand, um, there will be light brought to that place. So for example, I was working on a record about deep depression mm -hmm. and I was asking God, how do I make a record about this? How will it be any different from any other dark record that's out there? Like, what am I doing as a son of God that's different from a non-believer talking about these same things? Yeah, or to get lost in it. Like, and I had this the clearest thought from God, which was, you can go anywhere. There's permission to go anywhere, hmm. so long as you're holding the hands with Holy Spirit. Yeah. And when you go there, it will not be a, a propagation of darkness. It will be an expelling of darkness. Hmm. We will go and bring the light of God to that place. So that image of holding hands with the creator of the universe and going to any place and to dream with him in that place um, has been so compelling. I, I, I haven't, I can't shake it. It's been since 2015, 2016. Um, and I, I'm, I'm in the infant stages. I'm still, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know it's a really compelling way to work. Well, I think... Coming to the place where you can admit that you don't know what you're doing and yet, and yet still feel solid and good and like grounded. I think it's so hard. It has from own personal experience. Um, it's so easy to feel inadequate. It's so easy to feel like worthless or get so down and so hard on yourself for not knowing or for like, oh, if I just had this one idea that blows up. Or if mm. I just, oh, if I just have this one thing and I'll make it. And mm. then making it is what it all it becomes about. Um, yes. that, it's a terrible way to live. Yeah. It's a terrible it, way it's to work. Such a, it's such a prison. Um, and a lot of it through my conversations with you and diving deep, um, I can, I just see, I mean, even through your albums and whatnot, listening through those things, it's like you see the journey, you see the through line. And I, 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 there's been points in my life, even just in knowing you or looking into the past where I can, I can almost like put myself on like <laughs> that similar creative journey of, of the ups and the downs. Um, and so it's always been fascinating uh, to talk to you about like that process. Um, there's like four things I want to like go into that we could branch off into, but we let's go into we kind of have to pick one. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. Um, I think it's fascinating really briefly to talk about like, um, I was just reading in uh, this this morning, The War of Art, 
um, he was talking about um, like muses and doing like the history of like genius and what that actually mm. was. Mm -hmm. And I find it so fascinating that it has been a long standing fascination of humanity as far as like where does creation come from um, and like harnessing it. Um, and so they've uh, old like civilizations from uh, the past and what they put like names to it. They tried to put names to it mm. um, where like that's where muse comes from, the muses of um, like Greek mythology mm -hmm. um, that they would come upon man and yes. then you would create this this insanity of the brilliance would come through. And then in a little bit more modern times, it was named the genius. Mm -hmm that you would have a genius in your walls mm -hmm. of your studio or whatnot. And if you just failed or you weren't doing well, oh, well, it's not my fault. I'll, I just need to move. I just need to go to another room or another place to get a better genius or like to find the genius in the wall again. Hmm. And so I think so many people have been searching for so long um, for what that is and where it comes from and, 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 um, I think it only makes sense for, for like us in that that is like connecting with the father that is connecting and bringing him in. Um, and I know for myself and potentially others, it's so easy to try and hold like, Oh, God gave me the gift of creativity. So I need to be creative like by myself mm. when in reality, it, it is that partnership. It is that connection. It it's a is, um, communing with him yes, uh, and bringing him into that space is uh, sometimes so hard. Hmm. Um, was it, was it hard for you to make that? I mean, before and after, and it was that difficult as far as a shift um, or did it just kind of feel natural? It did feel natural. I, began learning about the secret place, cultivating the sense of the presence of God in my life on the daily. Around that time, 2015, 2016. And it felt like a, an extension of that. It was like, this isn't just my creative time that I invite God into. It became, this is a sacred space. Hmm. Like, this is also where I meet with God. In one context, I might have ambient music playing and a candle lit and a Bible and a cup of coffee. And in another, I might be in front of a laptop, you know, or a microphone. But this space internally felt very similar. Mm -hmm. It was it was just a meeting place. So I don't, I don't know. It didn't feel hard. It just felt as simple as inviting God, inviting Him and listening you know, we, we're a church that honors the prophetic, and one of the ways to honor the prophetic is listening prayer. Hmm. You know, God, what do you want to speak? And so it felt like that. Yeah. God, what do, you, what do you have to say about this? Yeah. And um, sometimes that would come very directly, where I, I've had occasions where I've heard sounds coming out of my speakers that weren't there, and I solo every single thing, and they weren't, it, it wasn't there. <laughs> And I heard God say, well, just record what you hear. Right. And I literally threw up a microphone and did what I heard coming out of my speaker. Very, very obvious. And other times it was very abstract. Yeah. A dream. Um, you know, God speaking to me when I least expected it. But it was just a conversation. And when we make records, it's probably important to note, we don't, this doesn't happen lightning quick. So I usually make an album over the course of three years. Mm -hmm. So these are ongoing conversations with God mm -hmm. through the process. And it's not all happy. I mean, there's a lot of me complaining and what have you gotten me into, God? <laughs> you hate me, don't you? Yeah. Um, of course, I'm, I, I can be playful with God and come back to a place of, okay, I know you're good. Um, what is the solution? How can I, how can I move forward? And Ten times out of ten, there's there's a solution, mm -hmm. and so it's just playing in that, staying in that place of humility. Yeah, there's a lot of trust. Um, 
that, that does take a lot of trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that directly relates to your relationship with, with him. Yes. Um, as how, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not how well, but uh, how much you can actualize or um, like if you're not um, seeking him, if you're not invested in that, it's probably going to be harder to hear. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, probably going to be harder to, to, to operate in that space. Absolutely. It, it's, it's informed. It's not like this happens separate from the rest of my life. Yeah. This is a massive part of my life. It's not all of my life. Mm-hmm. But it's my art is intertwined with my life, and so absolutely, there's blocks if I'm not seeking God or if I'm living in sin, um, that might manifest in this area as well. Mm-hmm. But lest we like take this point too seriously or too, uh, <laughs> I don't. I, I would hate for people's takeaway to be like, uh, this is how you make art with God. First you do this and then you do that. The thing that I tell people when I'm talking about this is it has to be playful. Mm. It has to be childlike. For me, it's driven by curiosity and wonder. I just have a lot of questions about the world. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I was, my parents said I, uh, they couldn't get into a conversation with me as a four-year-old because I would always keep asking why and they would give some parent answer and classic like, why question. but why i remember coming home as a four-year-old and it just hit me i went to this presbyterian preschool and the lady was reading this passage and she read the pronoun he for god and i was just fascinated with like why does god call himself he and not she hmm. and it's, you know we're having all these discussions here in 2023 but as a four-year-old in the 1990s i went home and asked my parents like why is god not a she hmm. and they were like uh, <laughs> so like I've just been fasted. I'm just genuinely curious. Like, why does God speak? And but also about the world. It could be science. I'll get into astrophysics. I'll get into um, uh, anything. I mean, I, I, your my imagination can be captured anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so then you just go on a journey with God. Well, why did you make it this way, God? Why did you speak this? Why did you do this? And I'm just asking questions all the time about yeah. Him, about the project he's given me to do about the world around me. And it's just continually fun and I'm continually exploring. And I believe that's the secret to sustained creative output. A lot of times you see people in their work will decline, you know, in their later years, but I don't think there's any like biological thing that would, that would, uh, impede. There's nothing that necessitates that. There's no like, Humans are cre- they're creative until they're 35 and then they're just lame. Like that's absolutely not. I think it's, it is socialization and it, 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 is, it is coming to hold a view of the world that is certain and unchanging mm. and you get set in a way of doing things and you lose that sense mm. of excitement. You lose that sense of, but why? Yeah. Or what if it was this way that children innately have? And so I... <laughs> the artists that are most compelling for me are the ones who just stay on that journey mm-hmm. and you never get too comfortable. Um, Brian Eno, one of my favorite music producers says, make a record, but then never make it that way again. Never make the same record twice. And there's something about that for me. When I pr- approach a new record, I want to do something that I've never done before. Specifically, uh, you know, whether it's a genre or production techniques that I'm not familiar with. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I'm taking, you know, 15 years of production knowledge into that curiosity and into that exploration. So it's and not what like... what you learned from the previous one. Exactly. So it's not like I'm starting from scratch. All, all but there, I do like that place of like, I'm like sink or swim. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. And it's so fun for me because yeah. in that place... There is magic. So for the next record that we're making, I know nothing about house music. I've never cared about dance music my entire <laughs> life. But the last four months of my life, we're finishing up one record, and I feel, my, I feel myself groaning for the next. And I find myself fascinated with house music. Yeah. And like late disco, and how did we get, how did we get here from there? And I've just been on this binge 
and I feel like a kid in a toy store when I do music productions. I have this, uh, I have this Pro Tool sessions called Explorations. Mm. I don't know if it will become the next record or not. There's no pressure for it to. It's yeah. just called Explorations. See, I think I think that's not more or less all. Oh, this is the topic of the podcast that we're talking about, but just this sense of like. The or what you were saying is oh the takeaway for the for the people listening or whatnot is to this is how you commune with God and this is what you do and this is art and all of that it's not I, but it's almost it's this, a fluid thing it's this thing of of being able to admit of just like the I don't know and that's amazing and like that's that's what I find like very fascinating about like how you operate is just like that I don't know is the most exciting part really where I is. think so many people, including myself, um, they, they absolutely just like idolize the knowing mm -hmm. or the final product or what is it going to be? How is it going to, it's the after it's like, what is it going to do? Where is it going to go? Is it going to blow up? Is it going to, Oh, am I going to get how many followers? And Oh, it's got to be this. And, and trying to like, uh, like, mathematicize that's not even a word this art thing mm -hmm. where as, as like you so much approach it as just this like all right yeah i am in this body of water of unknown something and it, it's sink or swim but like 10 times out of 10 like you'll swim in some way but it <laughs> in, might in not be way. the way that you thought it was or that you envisioned it to be but like something will be there. What's fun about that approach is that you learn things about the world and yourself that you never otherwise would. I never knew that I could do that. Yeah. I never knew the world could be this or that music, I keep using music because that's what I do, but yeah, uh, you know, filmmaking, writing, poetry, dance, doesn't matter. I didn't know it could be this. Mm-hmm. One of my new favorite directors is a director from Hong Kong. His name is Wang Kar Wai. He directed a film called In the Mood for Love, which is largely considered one of the best films ever made. On the most recent Sight and Sound Top 100 Films list, I think it comes in at five. Yeah, you said it was like top ten. It's, it's, it's high. Brilliant. I recommend In the Mood for Love to anyone watching. But I saw an interview with him recently, and... He's a director's director. So you have like Ryan Johnson who directed the Knives Out series and the last Star Wars and uh, Sofia Coppola who did Lost in Translation. They're asking him questions. So he, <laughs> they're like sitting at his feet. And one of them asked, how do you know when a film is done? And he said, when I run out of questions to ask. Hmm. <sighs> <laughs> That's so brilliant. Yeah. He starts every project with a series of questions he does not know the answer to. Yeah. And goes on this journey. And it's not even when he has figured out the answers to the questions. Mm. It's when he's run out of questions. There's That's an interesting delineation. Right? Yeah. Because it's, it's not even about knowing all of the answers. It's about the honest journey that counts. And I feel that... Art, it just feels plastic when an artist or a, a filmmaker or a musician, whomever, when they come at you with, I've got this thing that I need to tell you. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. It comes off like sermonizing. And listen, there's a place for sermons. <laughs> Jesus taught sermons and he also preached in parables. Mm -hmm. You know, he has these like direct repent and believe kinds of moments but he also comes at things slant and there was this fantastic emily dickinson poem where she says tell the truth but tell it slant mm. and i don't want to misquote her but essentially she says that there are some truths that direct on uh directly spoken could not be grasped yeah and so this is why jesus speaks in parables and he's okay with people walking away confused. This is amazing to me. We have 2,000 years worth of commentary, and we have the Bible written by the guys who not just heard the original parables, but got the inside scoop. I knew him. They're like, Jesus, what did you mean by that? And he's like, 
<laughs> and we get their inside scoop. And people are still debating 2,000 yeah. years later what they mean. So I think, what about, you know, the 55-year-old lady who walks home with this story hanging on the walls of her imagination? Jesus is okay with letting it sit there, but it does something in that place. Hmm. He tells it slant. And in the message, Jesus uh, is speaking of why he speaks in parables. And in the message, I think it's in the book of Mark, Eugene Peterson's translation says something to the effect of, I speak in parables so uh, so that they would be lovingly invited into the kingdom. Hmm. It, 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 is a, it is an invitation uh, to a, an entire world, not just to a belief system, but the kingdom of God is a, is a new way of living. We are called to be new creatures, a new creation. And parables give us glimpses into that world. Yeah. And in some cases, he doesn't even resolve the parable. The most famous example is the parable of the lost sons. Both are lost. Mm-hmm. One to antinomianism and reckless living, the other to religion, and both are equally damning, says Jesus. One is brought home, but this is the wild part. The other, Jesus, leaves in the field. The father simply says, come, celebrate with me. You know, my son has been lost and he's found. He was dead. He's alive. But the way that Jesus ends that parable is with the elder son in the field, undecided. Mm -hmm. This is the stroke of genius, though. Jesus is speaking this parable to Pharisees, who are themselves the older son. In that field. In the field. He is saying to them, what will you do? Yeah. You write the ending. Yeah. But the fact that Jesus had that kind of faith and could tell truth but tell it slant... That's fascinating to me. And so when I come at my art with, I have to say this thing, this is what I'm trying to communicate. There's a plasticity to it. It's uninteresting. It feels packaged. It feels to people like they're being sold something, which is why Christian art has the reputation it does without going into specifics. (laughs) I'm not going to knock anyone. But it's it's true. (laughs) I mean, it's like people don't want to feel like, hey, I have this thing. You need to buy into it. Nail, hammer. Here it is. If you just subscribe, you'll be good. Yeah. That's uninteresting. Maybe Maybe you really do have the truth. I believe that Jesus is the truth. But I believe there's, there's more compelling ways to invite people into that. Even Jesus himself had more compelling ways. He told stories that were open-ended and that were full of series of questions. Yeah. And that's what I'm getting at. As an artist, it's the series of questions that matter. It's the, it's the honest journey that matters. Mm-hmm. And that's something akin to our faith. I mean, Jesus says that to enter the kingdom, you have to become a child I, it, to me, that is a mirror of the artist's journey. To to be an artist, you have to become a child. It's that question, but why? Mm-hmm. But why? Mm-hmm. My kids ask. I have three kids. They ask me all the time, but why? But why? It's the same thing in as we are invited into the kingdom, um, when we are invited into the artist's journey. It's that childlike faith. It's that series of questions. It's that honest journey that matters. And when you don't have that kind of lens for looking at your work, you will only be trying to, if you start from the end, I have to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. This work has to save me. (laughs) This work has to blow up or all these people need to get saved or like whatever your end goal is, whether it's like driven by capitalism or your understanding of the kingdom of God. if you have a packaged goal in mind, it will not be compelling art. Well, it's almost, it's, it's putting a cap on it. You are putting almost this, this is the level into which it can reach. Yes. When uh, I think what you're kind of talking about is it is the limitless. It is the, the open-endedness of it could go anywhere. It, could, it can go into places you have no idea. You have no idea where it could go. But if, yeah, saying this this end goal of just, like, cap it, like, yep, this is it. This is all that, that it can offer. Mm-hmm. Um, Not just where will this go, like, where will the product land, but where will the work itself go? Mm-hmm. 
When yeah. I'm making records, I don't know where they're going to land. Yeah. Like, yes, I have vision. Yes, I have ideas of what I'm trying to manifest. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain sense in which I, Quincy Jones, who was Michael Jackson produ producer amongst others, uh, said when we recorded, when we recorded Michael, we always left room for God to enter the room. <laughs> so great. I love that. Yeah leaving room for God to enter the room. Like, we just don't know what's going to happen, yeah. but leaving that space. Yeah. Well, and, and, it, and from like a faith perspective, going back to that, I was even reading in, in Romans this morning where Paul is even talking about like, not necessarily your, like the personal interpretation of the word and, oh, it, it means to you what it means, this this thing of like... Um, um, singular, like personal, oh, this is my interpretation and everyone else is going to have, but he's talking about this like active participation mm. in the word. And, and I think too, like it mirrors with art. We were talking about if, if something is open and shut, you look at stories at films, whatever that are, that can be open and shut and you walk away and they most often than not, they fade. But if there is something, I'm, I'm sure most everyone like listening can find one thing in their mind where they walked away from something, a movie, a play, uh, an album, uh, a dance, some like anything that they saw, a building, architecture, whatever that is, and they walk away and they can't stop thinking about it. Mm. There's mm -hmm. a question. There's something that's stuck with them yes. that is not resolved Yes. or it, it continues to linger with them. And, and um, continues to speak. Mm-hmm. It drives, it, it drives you then, that's that spark, that seed that you then carry and it flourishes and then you grow something else that is the seed for someone else. And it's this, this constant growth. Mm. Um, so yeah, to not, to not limit um, or to not be scared of the unknown. Uh, I, I just need to preach that to myself, like over and over and over again mm. in, in trying to, uh, everybody has these lofty goals and these high ideals. And um, I don't think there's an artist out there that doesn't have like that, that vision for what it could be, mm -hmm. um, but to not be scared of not knowing um, and, and to be able to invite the Lord into that space and to create with him. What you're talking about. I think about this often, but what you're talking about is something that is is full of life. And when something is alive, what's happening to it? It's growing. It's becoming. It's changing. It's changing. And so I think about works that have stood the test of time, whether it's a great song, a great film, whatever. They speak to different generations, different things. Differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's mind blowing to me, but every new generation comes back to the Beatles and discovers something new, and, and it just fat. And I, I think about like Gen Z's fascination with Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. It's fascinating to me that that is speaking something different to that generation than it did to the original yeah. Gen X generation. But there's something on these works that uh, where, where where there is there is life that has continued to grow, and so the work, in a sense is still becoming, even though we've sort of stamped, like, this is the recording, or this is the performance, or this is the the final book. Mm -hmm. We've sort of said, like, this is kind of it. Um, but if it has that life on it, there's a very real sense in which it is always becoming. Yeah. And I don't think that we get there by by manufacturing uh, the end in our minds. Mm. I think it, it can only be done in a place of faith. Now, a lot of people that make great works of art have no idea that they're partnering with the God of the universe. In fact, there's a brilliant book. Oh, it just came out at the beginning of this year. The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin, one of my favorite music producers. Mm. He's produced everyone from the Beastie Boys to Adele. <laughs> and many in between. Um, Johnny Cash, Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, just a wide variety of genres and artists. Um, Jay-Z, 99 mm -hmm. Problems, when he says, when Jay-Z says, you're crazy for this one, Rick, Rick Rubin. 
Um, so why do people come to Rick Rubin again and again and again? Uh, because he has this innate ability to draw out of artists the gold. Mm-hmm. And he creates safe spaces for them mm-hmm. to fully be themselves. But this book is brilliant, and he talks about um, uh, creativity as not just a uh, an act, but it's a way of being. It's a way of seeing the world and being open. Now, when he's talking about these things, he talks about the source. He talks about the universe. Well, he's talking about the spirit of God. He mm-hmm. doesn't have that language for it, but that's exactly I mean, what he's talking going about. Going back to like the muse, the genius. Yes. Like these, trying to encapsulate what that is. Yes. It's the spirit of God. Yeah. And so I don't how to this this uh, this sort of bifurcated world, you know, you're either a Christian partnering with God or you're, uh, you know, a, a non-Christian partnering with the devil. Like, like we know that's not true. You can't hear certain works of art and, 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 and not hear God in them. Hmm. But there is an unknowing partnership. And so my question to believers is, how much more exciting is it that we knowingly get to partner with the God of the universe mm-hmm. in relationship and in intimacy I believe that one of the reasons God partners with creatives is because it's his way of pursuing them. Scripture says that his gifts are without repentance. And so he gives all kinds of people various talents, and they, they're <clears throat> using those talents uh, is a way of God pursuing them. They are experiencing a little bit of God. Yeah. And so it becomes a way of, 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 of communion. Uh, but how exciting is it that we get to walk into the fullness of that communion? Yeah, and it's, I mean, it says his, his gifts and his call are irrevocable. Yes. So it's, it's just, it is who we are. Yes. It's, it's part, it's just, it is. Yes. Um, it's this idea of partnership. I, I, I wish, I'm reading through the book of Leviticus right now. <laughs> I've never been so fascinated. I'm reading, I'm starting to read through scripture again. And I've just been blown away through Exodus and Leviticus, this, the intentionality of the tabernacle. It's, and I was like, God, why did it have to be this way? Why the bowls? Why the sacrifices? You were the one that made it all up. Like, I, I couldn't there have been any other way? Mm-hmm. And he spoke to me so simply. It's like, it was all a foreshadow of what Jesus would do. Mm-hmm. I'm the grand storyteller. Mm-hmm. This was only to give pictures of the coming revelation. Yeah. And... What you see in the book of Exodus when they're setting up the tabernacle is God wants all of the highest skilled craftsmen and craftswomen working on this temple, or excuse me, working on this tabernacle. And he says, those with excellence in their craft. And it says Bezalel, who is, was the, sort of the head architect of the tabernacle, is, uh, was given the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came upon him. And it's the first instance in Scripture where the Spirit of God comes upon somebody, hmm. was an artist. Hmm. And I love this because you see a partnership. So who gives the ability in the first place? Of course, it's God. But then who partnered with God to develop that? You know, and uh, the, the, the daily discipline, the, the scales that Coltrane had to play so that when he was on stage, yeah. he can improvise for 20 the training. minutes. The training. The training. That discipline is a partnership. It's an active partnership, participation on humanity's part. It is a stewardship. But then, get this, those who have done that, he puts his spirit upon for a specific purpose. Hmm. In this case of Exodus, it's to build the tabernacle. And then, Exodus is very clear. It says they, it says it like 10 times. They did exactly what God commanded. So if he said to build it this way with this kind of linen and this kind of you know thread, it says they did exactly what God commanded them. And then, so again, partnership. So if you're kind of tracking this out, God gives the gifts, uh, humanity partners with that gift, the discipline to to sort of come into the full fruition of that particular gift. Then God puts a, his spirit upon that craftsman for a very specific purpose, gives them a specific thing to do. But then humanity has to obey and do that thing. And then at the end of Exodus, it says when Moses finished the tabernacle and he finally completed everything that God gave them to do, the glory of God 
comes and rests. Isn't that beautiful? It's back yeah. and forth. Mm -hmm. It's not one or the other. But in partnership with him and step in step with him, he gives us the thing to do, and then he gives us his spirit to do it. And as we obey, his glory rests upon us. Mm -hmm. Like, what else can we ask for? Yeah. That, I believe, is the model. Yeah. That is making it. <laughs> <laughs> really, we have, to, we have to redefine our understanding of success. Yeah. Because for you, if your understanding of success is this, this nebulous, like, I want to make it, well, even at the highest levels, there's still somebody higher than you. Mm -hmm. And if you're like the top of the top of the top, well, you're fearful of somebody taking your position. So like there's... There probably is, pretty lonely too. <laughs> and so there's no, there's no arriving. There's, yeah, there's no scenario in which that is a, like you win. There's no win there's no condition. There's no fulfillment. Yeah. And so we have to redefine success as faithfulness. I had to do this a few years mm. ago. Um, I wanted to get back to the language of scripture. I found that in 2016 to 2020, the la my language was starting to depart from that of scripture. And I think in a lot of the prophetic movement, it was as well. And I, by 2020, I was asking some questions like, about the prophetic movement. Like, where, where did we go wrong? And why did it get that way? And one of the answers I, come, I came to in 2020 with some serious soul searching with the Lord was that we had, we had largely abandoned the language of scripture. Um, God bless words like breakthrough and things like that. But that's not a word I find in scripture. Even things like influence and, you know, the desire to be an influencer. This isn't something that God asked us to attain. And so I found myself in 2020 reigning in my language. Hmm. What do I actually mean by this thing that I'm praying? What do I actually mean when I'm talking to people about the arts? And what language do I see in the mouth and life of Jesus? And so that was a word I found again and again and again was the idea of faithfulness. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to be a massive success or a huge influencer. Of course, God can do any of those things. Mm -hmm. But he's asking me to be faithful with the thing that he's given me to do. That is my barometer for success. Yeah, equating that to success. Yes. It's something that Sharon and I say all the time. We are... Uh, uh, our barometer for success is how healthy is our family. That's something we. So to me, my 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 whole life is is a fluid thing. So you know, my art uh, informs my family, and my family informs my theology, and my theology. It's all intertwined, and I happen to be in a band with my wife. So there's <laughs> these very fluid things. Oh, yeah. We'll go from you know doing quick vocal takes to like making dinner and helping with <laughs> the kids, and it's my whole life is a is a big bowl of spaghetti, but. <laughs> I, I come back to that. God, was I faithful with this project? Did, did I do the thing that you asked me to do? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, and if I'm satisfied, and even in a even in a more natural sense, if I'm satisfied as a creative, did this exceed my own expectations? Do I like it? Yeah. Then, then I've won. Yeah. Let it go into the earth. Yeah. And take wings. Yeah, and also in that too, um, the giving yourself the ability to um, like try and fail. Mm -hmm. I think I think saying uh, just those those words that really hit me that the faith to success, like that being your barometer, is is eye opening to me. Um, and I definitely want I will definitely be thinking on that. <laughs> Um, but also to something, uh, not on the flip side, but also in tandem with that is like, this is a process. Mm -hmm. like, this is a absolute like learning feel. Just, uh, this is not something that you just, oh, wow. I, uh, yep. I'm going to do this now for, for forever and always. I'm never going to struggle with this again. <laughs> um, but to have the grace to try and fail mm -hmm. and to know that you're not going to do it every time. I'm sure with, with certain albums or certain songs or certain any endeavors, it's certain things in your, in your family life where you try and it does not come out the way. But to not take that as like then an opening to degrade yourself or somehow come down, but like almost like come back to it again with like 
another question Mm -hmm. and then again continue the process from there like the 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 concept of of just not knowing what you don't know like the only way to get through that is to try Hmm. is to iterate is to work on it and i think um at least for me i've had there's been this so much this expectation of like well i should just you know i should just figure it out i should just know it i should just be better when like again that's not at all what god asks us to do or to see like how god um mirror like he shows us perfection he shows us this but he doesn't he asks us to follow it not to like like oh you have to be perfect or you are a failure mm. like he asks us to to seek after it to be in process with that to be faithful to keep coming back um but yet having this expectation of perfection uh, and then that is the only that is the only goal that is what not and anything less than that is, Perfe- is there, there's, gets, there's nothing that will gets muddy will kill your art quicker than than perfectionism yeah because perfectionism is inherently fear based yeah we want the product to be perfect so that we will be accepted and there's no risk for you and we want to eliminate all risk mm-hmm um, to combat that, I was working on a record in 2013. I hung a sign in my studio above, on my desk where I used to work. Mm-hmm. And it said, fail big, you have a father who loves you. <laughs> so talking about my journey, how did I become the way that I, it was steps like that. Yeah. And um, I realized in prophetic circles, they would say things like, don't prophesy failure over yourself. How could you say that? <laughs> I'm not, but I'm giving myself the freedom to make a mistake. Yeah. And to course correct. It's okay to say that didn't work. I don't have to release it. There's a delete button on my computer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it works really well. And, uh, you know, hard drives being what they are, you have almost infinite space available. So it didn't work. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay. The world has gone on. Let me try it a different way. And I can't tell you how many times things that I thought were failures in the moment. Mm. Six months later, a year later, I come back and I'm like, I need this industrial sounding beat what kind of thing can i use oh that I already made that that wacko session from a year ago where yeah. i was just making bizarre sounds this would be perfect and then it looks like you're brilliant people are like how did you come up with that i didn't come up with it or in the <laughs> was, moment when i made that i thought this was the worst thing i've ever created yeah, i was just having fun and then all of a sudden it connected to what i was doing over here but the point i'm trying to make is <laughs> perfectionism is a fear-driven exercise in futility. <laughs> it just is. And that when I hear a lot of records, when every single thing is beat corrected, pitch corrected, every it's almost like we've submitted our our, our lyrics to you know for uh, public opinion before we release them, uh, just to make sure that everybody's cool with what we're doing. And <laughs> I want to make sure this has the most like hits avail- possible and. I, I, I was talking to somebody recently who they, they submitted their script uh, trailer, you know, they, they put it out online first to have people vote on which version was the best. And I was like, I mean, I, I'm all about like engaging your audience, but at some point, like you just got to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Like, like my art is not, you know, uh, decided by a committee. Like <laughs> it's not compelling to see like how many people this will land with. Like I just have to do the thing that's in front of me to do. Mm-hmm. And if I'm driven by fear and how it will be received, it will smell like that afterwards. I can just tell when something's made with that in mind. Yeah. But it's not to say that there's not great reworking that's uh, that, that, that that's not done in great works of art. So, for example, there are some Beethoven melodies that they found his compositional notebooks. There's 96 iterations of the same melody. Hmm. Now, you could say, well, that sounds like a perfectionist to me. I mean, I don't know Beethoven's inner world, so I couldn't say whether it was driven by fear or curiosity, but I have a suspicion that the great artists are the ones who just know it's not right until it is. Well, that's really interesting. Because you can do that out of a place of, I want this to be perfect so that it will be accepted. Yeah, 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 Or yeah, yeah. this has to be right. Yeah. 
and it's as that, an artist, you tipping know the scale between fear and like the next question, like how that's kind of the that scale. For me, what's what is driving that? Mm-hmm. Is it fear or is it curiosity? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we keep going. But I think that's a really great place to, to kind of wrap up and end this okay. conversation from all that it was. But it just to leave really quickly at the end, I think we, we touched on a lot of things that I think kind of had a, a, centri- a central focus. Um, and I just want to reiterate that that quickly of, I mean, we have we talked about just faith and the, and the connection to creativity and how innately, inherently that that is that is true. Mm. Um, we talked about, uh, I mean, we just talked about like the, the fear versus um, fascination, if you will, mm. and, and how you can kind of operate in, in that. Um, what else did we talk about? We talked about... I like the use of the word fascination. It has the yeah. al- alliteration. It has the alliteration. I, yeah. I wish I'd... I yeah. wish I had said that. Well, I said curiosity. You just took my point and made trade, it better. Trademark it. All right. Um, I'll get royalties. Sounds good. Um, every time somebody says it. Absolutely. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I hope that this was, I mean, I'm encouraged. This is exactly what I wanted in this, I think, conversation. Um, And I hope to have more with you. Um, Oh, we we will. So, Caleb, anytime chatting with you about the arts is a a good chat. So it's been, it's been an honor. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of the LCJ Podcast. We hope that this conversation blessed you. If you want to know more, please look in the description for more links and follow the Expression 58 socials to keep up to date on what we're doing. If you'd like to support the creation of this podcast, please consider donating. Visit expression58.org podcasts for more information. We'll see you next time.